If you're an experienced VNA user and are wondering what about Time Domain, you'll be pleased to hear that you can order Option 010 Time Domain with your FieldFox Microwave Analyzer. And this includes Time Domain Gating. If you're not familiar with what Time Domain and Time Domain Gating are, there are plenty of good application notes on Agilent's website. The test setup I'm using here is a little 20 gigahertz saw filter connected to the FieldFox via two of these purple microwave cables. So the signal from the FieldFox will come through the first cable, through the connector join here, through the second cable, and to the saw filter. And then I have the other port of the saw filter terminated with a 50 ohm load. You'll see I've set the frequency range on the Field Fox to cover its entire range. That's 26.5 gigahertz in the case of this model I've got here. And in fact, I've just done an instrument preset. I'm not even going to perform a calibration because every Field Fox is supplied with a Cal Ready calibration where the uh, at the factory a full S parameter calibration has been performed at the reference plane of port 1 here. You can see here on the display we're measuring S11. That's the return loss of the entire measurement system. So this response here is in fact the return loss of both of my purple cables, the connectors, the launch onto the filter, and the filter itself. And the first thing you'll notice is that there's quite a bit of ripple on the return loss trace. This is typically characteristic of a poor match somewhere in the measurement system. And this is where time domain can be incredibly useful to try and identify any point in the measurement system that is not 50 ohms and is providing a, a reflection to the incoming signal. So I'll press Mesh Setup, Transform, and Transform On. And the FieldFox is now performing an inverse Fourier transform of the return loss trace. We're still measuring return loss on the y-axis in dB, but on the x-axis, instead of sweeping frequency, we're now displaying time, starting at zero seconds on the left-hand side of the display, and three nanoseconds on the right-hand side. Now, zero seconds is our time reference, and that corresponds exactly with the calibration plane when we calibrated. Now, in this instance, we're using the uh, CalReady that came with the Field Fox, so we know that zero seconds is this point here. And as we move along the trace, we're moving along through the measurement system until eventually we reach the filter, which is this large response here in the middle of the display. Now, if you're wondering what all these other bumps are on the trace, I can quickly show you. This one here I know will be from the connector join here at port one on the analyzer. And this one here, which I've marked with marker 1, is going to be this join here, which I can quickly show you by separating the cables. That's created an open circuit on the end of this cable, and you can see marker 1 there is on that peak. So we know that that distance from the reference plane, port 1, is the length of this first purple cable. I'll join them together again. And we can do the same test with where the second purple cable joins the filter. So I'll just undo that and create an open circuit again. And you can see I've marked that with marker 2. Again, the large reflection indicates the end of the cable, the open circuit. I'll put the filter back on. And finally, I'll do exactly the same, but for the output of the filter. Now this is going to be harder to see, but you'll see I've put a marker here, uh, marker 3, on the bump indicating the open circuit at the end of the filter. Now you can see, in fact, this filter physically is quite short, but electrically it's quite long, presumably because it's a, a saw filter of some type. We'll put the termination back on the filter. So there are a few things we can learn from looking at the time domain trace. First of all, the largest response is indeed the filter, but maybe when we were looking at S11 return loss, that trace was being affected by these other discontinuities on the trace. Perhaps they were causing the ripple. And now that we know the cause of these discontinuities, we might go away and perhaps improve the cables or the connectors or improve the design. But the FieldFox has an especially useful function called time domain gating. What time domain gating does, if I just turn it on, where these blue markers are, it keeps the trace. But to the left and to the right of the markers, it artificially sets the trace data to zero. 
In other words, it has deleted from the time domain response the non 50 ohm discontinuity effects that we don't want to measure when we're measuring S11. In other words, the cable, the connectors, adapters, etc. In fact, I've even trimmed the markers in close enough to negate the effect of where the uh, APC 3.5 millimeter connector joins the SMA female on the board. So we've removed the effect of the launch onto the substrate as well. So I'm, if I now turn off the inverse Fourier transform, but I'll leave the gating on, you'll see we're back in frequency domain again, but much of the ripple on the trace has now disappeared. In fact, the gating on off button is still available even in frequency domain. So I'll show you that is the response with the gating turned off. And you can see the ripple here caused by multiple reflections from the non 50 ohm discontinuities in the measurement path. If I put the gating back on, it smooths all of that out. And now we're truly measuring the return loss response of just the filter and not the rest of the measurement system. Time domain and time domain gating provide a tremendous insight into what's going on in your RF system. In this case, we're able to remove uh, the effect of a few cables and joiners, which to be honest, we could have removed anyway by calibrating at this point here. But when out on site, maybe this was a poor quality bulkhead connector, uh, we would easily be able to identify that the uh, perhaps we couldn't see the antenna or the filter at the far end because of the poor response from this bulkhead connector. If we were only looking in the frequency domain, we would never be able to tell. But by going into the time domain, we can see these discontinuities. There's another valuable lesson we can benefit from by having time domain on our field Fox analyzer, and that's the ability to measure good quality or poor quality adapters and connectors. If in where these two purple cables join, I'm going to insert uh, some $30 adapters that I bought. They're a pair of uh, Type N to SMA connected back to back. So with the adapters now inserted, you can see this huge reflection from the poor match of these adapters. And in fact, if I go back to the frequency domain by turning the time domain transform off, you could hardly even see the response of the filter. In fact, you probably wouldn't know the filter was there. Even if I turn time domain gating on, it still makes very little difference. We still can't see the filter because there's almost no signal reaching it. It's all being reflected back by these adapters. So whenever you're doing network analysis uh, or any microwave measurements, just spend a little more and get a decent quality set of adapters. And of course, as with every measurement on the Antelant Field Fox, we can save the measurement results as a PNG or trace file to the internal memory, an SD card, or a USB memory stick, along with the complete instrument state. For further information on the Field Fox microwave analyzers, application notes on time domain measurements, or further information on vector network analysis, please contact your local representative or visit the website shown below.